Christ is risen. Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. When I was a boy, uh, just about 13, maybe 12, 12, 13 years old, I had pneumonia. I had walking pneumonia, and, um, which means I didn't have to go to the hospital, but I did have to stay home, and I was stuck in the bed. And I was bored, and my mom bought me a book. And it was Isaac Asimov's um, uh, Foundation series, the first book of the Foundation uh, series. Some of you are looking at me like I have a third eye, like you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's your loss. It was a trilogy, but then he expanded it out, but I don't want to go into too much detail. But that was the first book that I read, uh, the science fiction genre, and I was hooked. I was hooked. And so I consumed everything I could. And there was another series, another guy by the name of Frank Herbert that wrote a book, uh, actually a series of books on, on Dune. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. They made an absolutely horrendous movie of it uh, in the 1980s that is, is actually painful to watch. So painful that I absolutely watch it every time it's on. <clears throat> there is a phrase in there that I think is really cool. And it's when young Paul Atreides is going to be tested by the Bene Gesserit uh, order of uh, the, the female priests, priestesses that they have in this religion that they have in the empire. And he's, it's, it's a terrifying test. It's, it's called the Gom Jabbar. And, and uh, he has to put his hand in a box and it's mental. And, uh, oh, no, no, it's, it's too much detail. Never mind. Uh, but he says something before he faces this test that I want you to listen to. He says to himself, and it's a very famous phrase in the book, and it's something that they say over and over again, and they're trained religiously how to say this. And he says, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Last week, we talked about our dear friend Thomas the Believer. And we spoke about doubt. This Sunday, we're going to talk about fear. Because you see, brothers and sisters, it is not a mistake that the church, in her love for us and in her wisdom sets these Sundays after Pascha to deal with this mind-shattering event. I want you to pay attention here closely. Let's be honest. In the Christian faith, reading all of these accounts of the resurrection, this is the reason why it gives me such great confidence that it happened. It's a weird story. I mean, it just is. It's just a, this is a weird story. This is a, this is a bizarre story. We think it's all cut and dry that Jesus, you know, he gets up out of the grave and the stone's rolled away and he gets out and he goes and he spends 40 days with them. But notice what's going on here in these resurrection stories. They're afraid. They don't say anything. Then they tell everybody. They're not quite sure who he is. When they see him, they don't recognize him. And there's all kinds of things going on here that really lend credence to the fact this is, these are eyewitness accounts of an absolutely unbelievable, amazing event. You don't see a lot of people that were crucified on Friday afternoon walking around Sunday morning. That's not something that happens every day. And this very strangeness of these accounts, the very strangeness of these events lend credence and credibility to the witness of these eyewitnesses. This makes me believe the story more. If they were con men trying to con us into believing something that, weren't, that wasn't true, everything would be sweetness and light and ice cream and candy and daffodils and everything would be wonderful. Oh yes, Jesus got up and uh, we met with him and it was wonderful and we had pictures made and it was great. But the very messiness of the accounts, ladies and gentlemen, convinces me this really happened. Jesus Christ is not dead. And I love the reaction to all the people. Thomas doubts the myrrh bearers are afraid. 
But notice, neither the doubt nor the fear keep them from the glorious truth. And you see, King, this is what I want to bring you this morning. If you're a normal human being, and most of us are, I don't want to speak for everybody just in case. If you're a normal human being and you have a normal human life, you've got a lot of stuff going on in your life. You're busy. In fact, you're so busy, you don't have time to do the important things in your life. It's just true. Let's just be honest. I'm going to confess something to you. <laughs> Sometimes I'm so busy doing stuff for God, I forget to spend time with God. That's a real danger in the clergy, in the priesthood. That's a real danger. You get so busy doing stuff for God that you forget to spend time with God. And that's so deadly, brothers and sisters, to a spiritual life. It's very, very deadly to us. But it's equally as deadly to you when you find yourself so busy doing good things that you neglect the best things, like daily prayer, daily reading of the Holy Scriptures, fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, keeping your faith so serious putting your faith at the top of your priority list that your faith comes before your business. Your faith comes before your hobbies. Your faith comes before that which comforts you. And brothers and sisters, that's a rare thing. It doesn't happen a lot. And most of the time we need things to happen in our lives over and over again to keep us awake to the need to do this in our lives. But we often go to sleep to it. We lead normal lives. We have normal situations in our lives. And in our normal, let me change, may I change that? Could I reverse all of that just a second? Let's change the word normal to abnormal. Can, will you let me do that? Because it doesn't make sense to give away what you can't keep. For, it does make sense to give away what you can't keep for what you can't lose. It doesn't make sense to me to, to forfeit eternal things and waste, waste your best energies and your best time on temporary things. That doesn't make sense to me. And so what the, the scriptures do for us in these Sundays after Pascha is to give us these deadly barriers that keep us from growing in our faith and keeping our faith a priority in our lives. The first one we talked about last week was doubt. This one we're going to talk about today is fear. And I don't know if you know much about fear. I don't know if you've ever been afraid before. Uh, I confess to you, most men lead, I agree with, the, with, the, with the, the, the poet that said, most men, and I'll include women in here, most men and women lead lives, watch this, of quiet desperation. Most, most of you today here, let me change that. Most of us today here, if you're going to be honest, and folks, let's be honest, most of us lead lives of quiet desperation. Most of us are scared to death most of the time. What if I die today? What if I have a wreck? What if I lose my job? What if I lose my home? What if my children don't turn out well? What if they get sick? What if I get sick? What if the business goes down? Most of us are constantly focused on things that drive our reactions and our lives to uh, consume and become addicted to our fear and our terror. And when we do that, we make our, watch this, we make ourselves slaves to our external realities. And when you become a slave to your external realities, brothers and sisters, there is no deeper slavery than that. And what drives you to your slavery, to working 80 hours a week when you don't have to, to constantly being afraid of being sick to the point where you get uh, neurotic, terrified about raising your children, don't let them go outside. I'm the world's worst at that. I'm an ex-police officer. So anytime the children walk outside, I assume there's 15 rapists, 400 murders, and 700 cars that are going off the, off the rails, all about to hit them all at the same time. That's just, I'm paranoid. And so I constantly have to fight that tug towards fear. You do too. And even if you're living your life asleep, when you have a momentary action of fear, you react rather than prepare. And your life is a, is a, is a series of reactions to the external stimuli that are going on in your life. You're a slave. You're not free. 
And brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it, the message of the Orthodox faith and the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is your freedom. If mortality is defeated, gang, what is there to be afraid of? If physical death is no longer anything more than just a temporary nuisance, what is there to be afraid of in your life? If you lose your job, if you get sick, if you lose your home, those are all temporary setbacks at best, even if they last till you die. Because even mortality has become a temporary setback. It's not an eternal reality. Jesus Christ has destroyed every temporary enemy you could ever have when He rose from the dead, and now He calls you to a life of freedom. And when you live as a slave, you make a lie of the resurrection. When you live as a slave, you testify to the world, Jesus Christ is dead. When you live as a slave to your anger, to your fear, to your bitterness, to your worry, to your despondency. When you live your life enslaved to those passions, you tell the world Jesus Christ is dead. But Christ is not dead. And so when you tell that to the world, you're lying to them. And you're lying to yourself. It's time to stop lying to yourself and being driven by your fear rather than your faith. Your life should be motivated by your faith, not your fear. Your life should be motivated by your confidence in Jesus Christ's victory over death, not your constant worry that you're not going to be strong enough because here's the newsflash, folks, you're not. I turned 58 years old last Friday, much to the surprise of, well, including myself. And you know what struck me? I was afraid and I was angry. By the way, the reason why I was angry was because I was afraid. You know, anger is not a primary emotion. It's always a secondary emotion. Anger is caused by something. It is not the thing itself. So anger is a secondary emotion. But I found myself afraid and angry. And you know why I was afraid and angry? I was afraid because I, re I recognized, you're about to wrap it up, buddy. You got 20 years. If, you got, if, you, if, 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 you're, if God's very good to you, you have 20 years. And let's be honest, folks. You know me well enough to know I got things I want to get, I want to get done. I want to get things accomplished. I don't want to leave before I'm finished. Here's a newsflash. I'm going to leave before I'm finished. It's going to happen. So why in heaven's name are you afraid of something that's guaranteed? That doesn't make any sense. Laying that fear aside, brothers and sisters, invites me to take the message of my orthodox faith seriously. Jesus Christ is not dead. Jesus Christ is not dead. Jesus Christ is not dead. And if He's not dead, you don't have to be either. On this Sunday of the Merbears, as these women refuse to allow fear to keep them from love, let us mimic their love and their devotion and go to the tomb together and see for ourselves that our God has loved us so much that He has crushed every enemy we could ever have for our benefit. And let us commit ourselves to never living as a slave again to defeated enemies. How foolish and sad to live my life under the sway of something already beat. Let us be free, brothers and sisters. Let us be liberated by the normal orthodox Christian faith that we claim we believe. Let us be orthodox on purpose. Amen.